Now, just a little um, like FYI, I am not a doctor, I am not a psychiatrist or, or anything along those lines. Now, unlike the dyslexia one, which we did, which had a lot of concrete research, with autism, you know, we do not have a definitive answer. So a lot of these things are going to be theories. They might be in different stages of the research. But I'm more than happy to send any resources or any references of where the data came from to back it up. But with that aside, we'll get going. For anyone who doesn't know, I'm Nat and I am the head of community at an organisation called Exceptional Individuals. We support neurodiverse talent flourish in a whole wide array of things. And every single Thursday at 12 midday, we deliver a free webinar on neurodiversity. We do this to share knowledge and also build up a community so people feel a part of something. And I'm pleased to say we there's so many people I can see today that come week in, week out, which we are incredibly grateful for. So normally at EI, that's what we abbreviate it to. We support with like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, but we're gonna do a real hyper-focus today on autism. Autism spectrum, disorder, condition, Asperger's, whatever you like to call it, that's what we're gonna be doing a deep dive on today. Now, as well as supporting people with these neurodiversities, we also help people get into jobs, we help companies thrive, we do workshops, we do a lot. But what makes us really unique and special is that 80% of our team is neurodivergent, and that's something we are incredibly proud of. Myself, I also have all the lovely things mentioned, and for that I think there's pros and cons, or challenges and strengths, and we are going to hopefully be looking into both of them while diving into the science. So the science of autism. As we mentioned, the science is still very early on. Uh, spoiler alert, we do not know what causes autism definitively. But we do have a lot of theories and there is some widely held knowledge which most people agree on. But that's not to say it's not without contention or controversial in some means to some people. So just keep that in the back of your head. Basically, it's to do with communication. You might struggle with communication more than your neurotypical, someone who doesn't have autism, peers. And it has been, it's had a really interesting history. And if you want to know about the history, I really recommend going to our YouTube channel and you can see a whole hour webinar on the history of it, as well as one coming up on Asperger's. So a quick 101, how many autisms are there? Do you think there's no autisms? It's a made up thing, it's, it's just nothing. One, there's only one, one autism to rule them all. Two, or are there many of them? Nice, many. So it's interesting, yeah? it's a bit of a, a bit of a trick question. None, well, because ultimately it's just a label we use to categorize a set of characteristics so maybe none could be correct one because officially asd autism spectrum disorder is one definition or one label that we use to put everything in a nice easy to understand way two because a lot of people think of autism and asperger's though remember asperger's has now been smushed into asd but many, because though we are all diagnosed with one label currently, that doesn't mean we're all the same. There are so many different types. So to really to pinpoint what makes autism autism is really, 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 really difficult. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't been able to figure it out. So the next one is two or three. Autism is genetic. It should be a question mark. Is it true, false, or can't say? So do you think it is genetic? Meaning, does it run in the family? Interesting. Okay, we've got a lot of people saying true, only a few false, and a few can't say. Well, it is true to a point so we know it does is genetic to some point we might not know all the information but it is so it's the correct answer is true but it's also can't say because more research is needed essentially 
we've got a correlation. But we must always remember in science, correlation doesn't equal causation, which means the evidence points to it, but more research is needed. So uh, yeah, there, there definitely is a link. But as to how much, we will be going into that a little bit later on because there are some interesting stats about the uh, probability of being autistic if one of your family members is also. And the next one is, is there a correlation between environmental factors and autism? So we talked about like nature v nurture. So things around you, could it be passion? Could it be upbringing? You know, the type of things which aren't internal. Yes, no, or can't say. Elliot says, there's a speculation that my dyspraxia comes from my bad side. It's very, very possible. Okay, so we've got, most of you said, can't say. Yes, I would say at the moment, it is theorised that it is part of the equation, but we don't know. I think there's more evidence to suggest genetics than it is environmental factors. You know, there is, like, speculation that it could form, like, during pregnancy. Um, it could be how you're exposed early on, different chemicals. And we are going to be exploring this one a lot more. And whether or not what you decide at the end... I don't know if it matters, but it is definitely interesting to ask these questions. Why do you think learning more about autism is important? And I know it might seem like a bit of a silly question at the beginning, but we always talk about autism being your like, you know, it's part of you. So why do we need to find out more? Do we need to find out a cause? Do we need to find out a cure? Or if we're happy with being who we are, is it even relevant? I would love to know your thoughts. Hazel says a family member was asked if she has a traumatic birth with her son as a possible cause of his ASD. Do you know what, Hazel? I it's it's possible because we can't rule it out, but there's also people who have traumatic births and no autism. I would probably say it's it's not the case, but it's still too early to say. I think the worst thing we can do is assume that everyone who has autism is due to the parents. That's called like the refrigerator mother, where we blame the mother for being cold or not doing a great job, when actually they didn't have anything to do with it. Okay, we've got to broaden an understanding, empathy as well as strategy, support other individuals to make the world more accessible, to understand how to be more inclusive, accessible for those who struggle, in particular with aspects to society, to display any misconceptions, to allow inclusion in communities, workplace, to help people live their best lives, nice, to help people with autism and their families, as well as inclusion, autistic people more fully in society, and betterment of society making use of everyone's individual talents. Nice, we've got some really, really good ones here. And absolutely, no matter what we choose to do with this information, the more we know, the better informed decision we can make. And ultimately, we can still, if we can make someone's life easier, then why shouldn't we? Or why shouldn't we at least learn how to and then give the people the opportunities whether or not to take that forward? There's is some really interesting research going on at, in the neuroscience department in Washington University. And a person called Adsad Boni says um, that there's an increased number of synapses creates miscommunication among neurons in the development brain that correlates with impairments in learning. So to break it down, in very early stages of while you're developing, there's different chemicals and different things that if they're in abundance of can correlate with challenges in learning. So there is real research going on, but at the moment you'll notice that all the writing is very careful. Now we are going to be using a lot of scientific terms today and I'm going to do my best to make them as understandable uh, as possible. One quick mention though, I am notoriously terrible at pronunciation, so if I pronounce something completely wrong, please excuse me, uh, it's, it's a real struggle. So first of all, what is genes? And we, we are going to go into a lot more information, but we've got to stay off, start at the basics so we're all on the same page. So interestingly, most of you have put a biomecular uh, molecule which contains genetic info. It isn't. It is actually the second one, a unit of DNA that controls development. So the first one, think of it as the actual DNA, like the DNA. And, and if you take a bit of the DNA, that little bit, 
would be the gene. So like genes are in DNA in a really simple form. So when we're talking about genes today, we're not talking about your DNA because your DNA is like the whole instruction manual when the gene is like one page. So we're talking about the page today. Different pages might contribute to autism, but your overall genome, no, there's like, there's too much going on there. And that's essential for every day-to-day -day life. And trousers, uh, you know, it's a joke. Okay. <laughs> so when we're talking about genes, a really interesting one is the umbiguitin liasis. Oh, I can't pronounce that, but you can read it for yourselves, hopefully. And it's a type of gene. So remember, think of it like a book. It's one page in a very, 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 very big book. Or maybe even a sentence in a book. It could be like absolutely tiny. But they attach to tags. And all tags are, think of it like categorizing DNA. So like they kind of clip onto the proteins. And proteins are molecules. They do most of the work in cells. They're absolutely required for function. So in our body, we all have proteins. Proteins, they are hard workers. And there's this gene that just kind of goes around and it will attach to the proteins. Now, it attaches to it with a set of information, instructions. They says, DNA is material. Gene is the one that codes for a trail. Okay, thank you. No, that's a good way of putting it. So think, when we're talking about genes, I like to think of them as like managers and the managers telling their employees, the rest of the cells, how to handle the tagged protein. So you've got all the like the information and it's got little like bits of like tags in and the genes will be like, okay, I want you to do that with that, do that, discard it, get rid of it. Think of them like Mr. Burns in The Simpsons. He is overseeing the whole operation, even though he might not actually be doing the work himself. He's, uh, you know, the, uh, the head honcho in the body. However, something that autism has a gene mutation. So mutation is when it kind of changes so much and doesn't work in the way that it was intended or the kind of the average way. And it stops this gene, the umbicuin liasis, uh, from working correctly. So remember, the genes are the, the bits of information gives you like tells you what to do. But if that information was bad, like you see Homer here, he's pouring water over his board. Not a good thing to do in a nuclear power plant. You're going to have a bad time. And this is all happening, happening under the hood. Not much you can really do. Another way of looking at it is if your manager who's telling you what to do gives you really bad instructions and you know, you can't help it. You're just following instructions. And people think that maybe autism could be due to the fact that the genes that tell our proteins what to do are actually kind of messing up the signal a little bit. So Kieran says, can this be measured? Well, it can be measured in different studies and like, uh, but not from person to person. You know, it's way beyond the average uh, deep dive. Which ones have you heard? So I've just explained, fingers crossed, the basic concept of what autism could be. It's about genes kind of giving dodgy information or unconventional information, shall we say, to your body, your proteins, the workers. And obviously that affects every single element in life. But there are other theories of what autism might be in a more granular detail. We've covered the basics, which most people agree on, but now we're gonna go into like kind of like narrower so we can get a more definitive answer. And we've got the mild, we've got the mind blindness theory, the triad of deficits, the triad of strengths and the dysfunction theory. Now I'm not surprised most of you has heard of the trial or triad of deficits or impairments because this is often talked about when we talk about autism or neurodiversity. It's also in neurotribes in the book and it's, it's quite well known. So we are gonna go into them today, but I'm not surprised not many of you have heard of the triad of strengths, which is a shame because we only focus on the negatives. We're gonna all have a very negative view of autism and the research just doesn't show that. The, the, the research shows there are both strengths and, uh, and challenges related to 
processing in the way that we know to be autism. So we're going to start off with mind blindness theory. So let's say we've got this one here, Sally. Now, Sally is in the room with Jill and uh, there's a basket and a box. Sally puts a ball in the basket. Jill, she's chill. She's not doing anything. Sally walks off. Now, Jill, she's a naughty one. She uh, she goes and in, goes into the basket. She steals the ball and puts the ball in the ba in the box. And then Sally comes back and she's like, where's my ball? Where do you think Sally is going to look? Now on here, you can actually put a little pin on the what, where you think she's going to look. And this is a test which is normally done. And if you're like, you know, do not have autism or other like learning conditions, you'll normally get it pretty much nine times out of 10. But those with Asperger's, what they would consider before high function autism, other types of classic autism can really struggle with this test and it's due to something called mind blindness. Now I notice most of you have put the basket in terms of where Sally will look, yet some one of you at least put the box. Now those with autism might for instance put the box. Why? Well it's obvious isn't it? You can clearly see that Jill has put the ball in the box. Uh, and you might just be totally blind to the fact that Sally wasn't there. Look, she wasn't here when the ball was going in the box. So it's about not being able to take all the information and putting it together. Where someone who doesn't have autism will be able to like kind of fill in the blanks. And if you think about it, it's very similar to, um, you know, when you do context or conversations, you expect the other person to have at least an understanding of, to like fill in the blanks, the missing gaps, but not always so easy with autism. So the mind blindness theory, autism spectrum conditions have a deficit in empathy. Now, this is controversial because when we think of empathy, we think of it basically being kind, and that is not the case. Well, when we're coming from a scientific perspective, empathy can help with emotional reactions, sympathy. So it's not just about looking at someone's character facial expressions and kind of forming a reaction, but it can also be with inanimate objects. So Sally here, she went off the screen and say someone with autism might struggle with the empathy to put themselves in her position. And if they had done that, they would realize that Sally was not there, so she wouldn't have the knowledge to pick the right box. And that's the thing, it's about putting yourself in someone else's shoes, but it doesn't always have to be in the way we kind of see it in like pop culture when we talk about being very empathetic. This may underline the difficulties in social and communication development. Another way we can talk about this mind blindness is the triad of deficits or impairments. As we mentioned, it's not so simple as just three things which make up autism, but there are about three or four things which are normally quite crucial in order to get a diagnosis. Because at the end of the day, autism isn't necessarily a thing, or we can't prove it because there's no gene, but a set of characteristics. So at the moment, you've got social. So if, you're, if you struggle empathizing in social situations and kind of like fitting in, tick. Then you've got communication. I, how do you get your views across? Do people understand you? If you struggle with that, another tick. And the last one, imagination of others' minds. So can you put yourself in their minds and kind of have an idea of what they may be thinking? If you have all of these difficult, then it's definitely possible that you might be on the autistic spectrum. And these are the things that we've used for such a long time now to understand autism in its current form. But as you all know, there's a lot more like nuance. So yes, everyone with autism will typically struggle with these. In terms of micro details, it will be very, very individual. So at the moment, we've got developmental benchmarks, understanding subtext, facial expressions, we'll definitely be getting onto that one in a minute, making connections, communication, emotional regulation, sensory, speech delay, executive functions, social interactions, fixed mindset, that's a good one. Yeah, all of these are completely right. Uh, but they're also individual. 
So a lot of these are the average means, but that doesn't mean that you have to have all of them in order to get a diagnosis. When you look at the criteria for like autism or any neurodivergent, you'll notice it's quite a long list. And typically they only look for like five or six of them in order to put forth the potential need of getting diagnosed. And that's why I always say when you do attend our other webinars and we say, you know, oh, am I autistic? Am I dyslexic? If you don't tick all those boxes, that doesn't mean you're not. But it also means if you tick all those boxes, it doesn't mean you definitely are. It, these are just the most common things that those who have been diagnosed also demonstrate. Okay, need, need for sameness, facial expressions, nice study difficulties, yep, anxiety, definitely. There's a real rule link there. Rules. Now... We always talk about the deficits, but what about the strengths? And this was one of the theories that a lot of you said you did, hadn't heard of before, the triad of strengths. And we mentioned the deficit in autism tends to be empathy, but not empathy in the way that most of us have come to understand it. But when we talk about the positives, one of the kind of biggest overall positives is systemizing. So that is being very process orientated, being very good at cataloging, being very good at kind of you know, seeing like micro details where you might struggle with the wider picture. So I normally like to think of it like autistic, autistic people are very detailed orientated, but might not necessarily be big picture thinkers as a way of like summarizing it. But we've got the eyeless of abilities, which basically means more focused in one area. You might have an obsession with systems, so you like routine, you like repetition, repetition, you like what some people might call mundane, and repetitive behaviour, which again is very similar. So do you like doing the same thing day in, day out? Other things that those might get bored with, you might not only be okay with, but might actively enjoy them. If you have all of those characteristics, it's also another good way of saying, you know what, you might be autistic. And this is great because, again, when we go for diagnose, get to get diagnostic or assessments, we always think of the deficits. We always think of the bad things. Why do you, if we, we're always talking about, you know, neurodiversity and the positives of autism and being different, then why are we still diagnosing people with the things that they cannot do or struggle with? Remember, neurodiversity isn't the deficit of ability. It's the fluctuation of ability. It's about having highs and it's about and it's about the difference between those peaks and troughs. That is the definition that we use at uh, exceptional individuals anyway. Okay, so we've got some interesting things here. We've got meticulous in approach, nice. Ability to provide details, attention to detail, brilliant at music, logical, punctuality, a sense of fairness, nice. And again, sense of fairness. You could say that's in contradiction of empathy. I don't think it necessarily has to be. It's just different types of empathy. Focus on interest, problem solving, logical thinking, higher IQ. That's definitely possible, but not essential in getting a diagnosis. Good at specific tasks, develop and refine skills. Really interesting. Dysfunction theory. This is the next theory we're going to be looking at. And this is that it shares research that proves that autism evolves a form of frontal lobal pathology. This leads to an inability to shift attention. Uh, so the frontal lobe is the front bit of our head here. And they've noticed a difference in this part of the brain to those who are not autistic. And they believe this slight difference could be the reason why you can struggle with attention shifts. So that's the last three. I'm not going to go into too much more detail about that one because I think, you know, that's more to unpack for another day. But I will go into in a moment, now we've done the theories, the type of research areas that is currently happening in the area. So I just want to ask you, which research areas have you heard of? And uh, <laughs> please excuse my pronunciations, but neuropsychology, uh, we've got none of these. Um, what other ones do we have? Oh, actually, you haven't heard of the others. So neurobiological aspects. So there are many different areas of science and many different uh, researchers that are probing every day to figure out what makes us tick. And I'm just going to be just really skimming the surface on some of the research that is currently going out there. Oh, nice. One of you have heard of the social brain. That's a really interesting one. All right, nice. So first of all, a lot of these research 
they really home in on abnormalities and that just means something either wrong or different or not expected personally the word sounds really negative abnormalities but i think it's just things that you wouldn't expect in a wider sample and these are all found in most but maybe not all autistic brains so first of all the celebarum and that is at the back part of your head here and that they always find that there's a not just a low amount of um per kink g those type of cells but a significantly lower like noticeable and that's quite interesting because normally we don't find as much of a it's normally a very minor difference then we've got the brain stem which is there the frontal and peririal lobes the hippocampus so in the hippocampus they, they find there we've got all those neurons are like really closely packed together uh, and also epilepsy is really common now again you don't have to have all of these things in order to be autistic but these are the typical abnormalities which people are likely to find if they were to do tests of those who have autism which as you can see it doesn't actually narrow it down that much does it because there's loads of them so uh, good luck in trying to find out the root cause even if there is one is neurophysiology theology blah, 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 that word um, but in short you see up there it comes down to the study of nerve cells I have simplified this, so if any of you are professionals, please excuse the simplification, but I want to make it as approachable as possible. And some of this research in this area have found that with those with autism, there's an arousal to sensory input. That's actually not that mind-blowing. We've always known that those with autism might struggle with sensory information. So, you know, music, sound, touch, feeling, you know, any of those senses... And if there's increased activity in the sensory areas, then your stimulant driven, then the stimulus is a driven processing. So if you're overstimulated, there's going to be an output and it could be stimming. It could be kind of being stressed, it could be anxious, uncomfortable. We know that. But on the other side, if there's a decreased ability with multiple inputs. So we've also found out that if you not just do one input, but if you have multiple inputs, it can kind of like do the opposite of arousal. It can really decrease someone's attention and they can just kind of like turn off. Yes, you might struggle in some areas such as processing multiple intelligence. And on the other hand, you know, you could be kind of, your body could be aroused or triggered or excited by multiple senses, but within moderation. This is why, um, some people with autism like fidget toys because, you know, they're multi-sensual. They, you know, they kind of trigger the senses. But if you were to give someone like a, uh, a rave disco with lights flashing and thunder sounds, they would not like it. It's really interesting. The next one I'm going to go on to is morphometry, <laughs> the study of organs shape variations. So again, they're all complicated words, but it just means the size of things in your head or in your body. And they, they ran them through uh, MRI scans, which you know, those big machines that you kind of like go through to like check out what's going under the hood. And they showed deficits, the things they weren't expecting, again, in the cerebellum, the, the brainstem, and the postural corpus co co <laughs> callosum. Oh God, today's a difficult one for me. But they've also found deficits in the parental lobes which affect narrow spatial focus of attention. So a lot of the characteristics that we attribute to autism, we've also can see a difference in the brain which would explain why that individual is struggling. Again, we can't prove it, but all we know is if this part of the brain affects this type of area, let's say speech, and that part of the brain looks different in those who have been diagnosed with autism and those who have not been diagnosed with autism, it's not a far stretch to put those two together, but correlation doesn't equal causation. So though we can make an assumption, more research is needed to truly understand if it's just a red herring or if there's actually a little bit more to it. Now on this one, I just want you to put a little dot on what you think is white matter. 
because we mentioned here that okay this is the study of the shape of the brain well like the shape of the insides and the sizes but how does this relate to autism well we know gray and white matter that essentially stretchy material inside our brain yeah you can see that yeah well done yeah so you see it's white here it's not actually white and gray in real life but when we kind of like cut it open or take a picture and dye it it typically goes lighter or grayer and those with autism, we've like noticed that it is larger, it's more bigger. So there is a difference in kind of head size, weirdly enough. Typically, you know, from like three to four, not much difference. But then after then, it becomes more noticeable. I think they did something like 95% of those with, who got diagnosed with Asperger's had a different size of their matter, which like, again, quite quite profound actually that, that's a really big percentage those with dyslexia for example might have less gray matter so we do know when it comes to neurodiversity in terms of all the lespraxia adhds that there is a big correlation between white and gray matter and having that condition but in terms of like is it more is it less is it kind of different that is very individual to the exact condition and not the umbrella the last one that we're going to be tackling today, I believe, is the social brain. And most of you hadn't have heard of this one. So when we talk, you know, with autism, we always talk about, you know, being a bit antisocial, not great in social situations. But why is that? Well, there's a certain kind of cocktail of things in your brain that result in being social. So social intelligence is a function of these regions. So the abduella, the orbitrofrontal, medical frontic cortex, uh, superior temporal subplex, the gyrus. Oh god, I butchered all of these. But essentially, if you have all of these, they normally, and they, you see the bits here, they're like lighting up. They normally uh, are responsible for the social part of you. And interestingly enough, a lot of these are where we find deficits in those with autism. So again, we can easily make a connection about the two. We can't confirm it, but it does seem very likely. And all of these is what we call the social brain. So those people with autism might have deficits in the social brain. It's just a good way of clumping all these areas together. Now, there's a really good way of kind of, a, well, not a really good way, but a test which is really kind of like famous for people with autism. Because when it comes to being social, it's also about reading people and understanding micro expressions. So abnormalities in the amygdala, or, well, in these areas, the social areas, are very typical with those of autism. So adults with AS have shown less of these activations during the reading the mind in the eye task. If you've never heard of this task, it's really cool. Uh, and you should try it yourself. So you see these eye here, they would get someone with autism or they think has autism, and I'd say, okay, what expression are these eyes? Are they joking? Are they cautious? Are they arrogant? Or are they reassuring? And it would be a very short time period and they'd have to answer quite quick. And those without autism were typically able to guess the right emotion, and those without with autism would typically get it right. You know, when we talk about people who understand what sad looks like, or happy looks like, it's way more complex than that. It's think of micro expressions, the kind of like the, the kind of like slight little twin in the mouth, the kind of glare in the eye, the things which you kind of make subconsciously be able to read, but those with ASD might really struggle to comprehend. So same here, I want you all to select this mental state. So look at these eyes, and is this person joking? Is he insisting? Is he amused, or is he relaxed? And I'm uh, really curious, because for me personally, I find this nearly impossible. I have no idea, but it'd be good to know about yourselves. Okay, interestingly, a lot of you think it's insisting, and amazingly, it is. How did you all get that? I really, I, by looking at his eyes, I honestly cannot tell that it's insisting, but I see a lot of you got it right. The next one is select another one. So I, if you're able to, I want you to look at a picture of a woman's eyes and ask yourself, is she being arrogant? Is she being grateful? Is she being sarcastic? Or is she being tentative? She is right, tentative. Um, it's really interesting that most of you are getting this right. I don't know, are you guessing? 
or or just no. But yeah, people with autism may struggle with that. And to quickly round this one up is genetics. So we talked about uh, factors in the world, but how much does it relate to you? Like how much can we blame on our parents? So if you have a sibling, you're 10 times more likely than the average population to also have autism. So it's very clear that there is genetics to play a part in it. There's also, there's a region called 17Q11.2, which is essentially right near the serotonin transport gene. And it has an increased serotonin amount. So yeah, we've got added chemicals in one area. Serotonin supplies the limbic system with nerves. It could play a role in emotional regulation and recognition. We don't know of it, but it definitely seems possible. Yet a autism gene has not yet been found. So we have talked a lot about potential theories, certain genes which have deficits or differences. But is there one gene which if you have that one gene, then you have autism? No, there is not. Now, I just want to ask now, do any of you in your family have autism? If so, just put a pin on it. So maybe your grandmother have it, your mother, your father, or you do. And it'll be interesting to see because though we know it's hereditary, it runs in the family, it doesn't mean it guarantees run in the family. So let's say your child gets diagnosed. That does not mean that you will necessarily have autism, but it does mean the likelihood is a lot higher. Or if, say, one of your children has autism, then the fact that one of their siblings may also have. It can also skip generations, so really interesting. So I see we've got someone's mother is, a lot of people they are, one person, we're not sure where they are on the ground. Now, the next bit is, what is next? Okay, so we're talking about the research that's currently going on, but what do you want to happen in the world of autism? I think the next thing is understanding what gene, which means if you have that, you are going to have all the characteristics of autism. And then once we've appreciated what that gene is, what does it mean? What do we do with that information? Do we want to cure it? Do we want to improve lives? Do we want to make it easier for people? Like great what next if you missed today which a lot of you did then you can always catch it on our youtube channel and we upload all our webinars there thanks to april and we can see we've got dyspraxic assistive technology dyslexia am i dyscalculic developmental language disorder a whole wide range search for exceptional individuals on our youtube channel and here's what's next if you have any further questions, feel free to email us, get in touch. If not, I'll see you at the next one. Could I possibly have the website details, please? Yes, so it's exceptionalindividuals.com. And there you can find all access to the support we offer, more information, blogs, quizzes, webinars. Uh, it's a really good place to start if you are, are new or want to learn more about yourself or people you support. Thank you. Great. Okay, nice. Well, I'm going to go now.